<laughs> yes! <laughs> We're in tune. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Real Guitar Live. This is my monthly question and answer session, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to see so many people. Hey, Tim, and Tom, <laughs> I haven't seen you. Well, I guess it's been a, a month goes by pretty quick. Um, Jack's there, and Shulamit, welcome. Okay, I'm gonna start out as usual with questions that were pre-submitted ahead of time. And well, I see some good ones. Please enter your questions in the chat box as well. And I, I will probably go back and forth, especially if you ask a question that's related to something I just answered, I'd like to answer it at the same time. Please put the word question before your question so I can glance. I, I can't see that well and on the screen. If if it's all mixed up with a bunch of text, I, I likely will miss it. So if you just put question, I'll see question, or even a big Q would work with a colon. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I, I will try to find it either way. I realize some people didn't hear this. Um, I'm here and listening. Hey, John. San Francisco, Sagar. Okay, you're not far. I'm over here across the bay in the East Bay. Hey, Mark. Mark. It says Mark Bai. I think that's uh, his last name. I thought he was saying goodbye. Anyway, let's start off with the first question. Oh, by the way, at the end of the session, I will um, do a drawing. I'm going to use my hat. I'm going to um, do a drawing for all the people who have uh, been a part of my Real Guitar Success program and have completed the monthly practice plan. So we're, I'm going to give away a $50 gift card. And I've got quite a few people have completed it, but um, one of them's going to get this gift card. But everybody's a winner because if you complete the practice plan, you're better at guitar and you should feel good about it. I hope you do. Let's start off with uh, a question from Shulamit and she's on the call. So please feel free to uh, add in if you're on the call. How do you do bass runs between chords that aren't necessarily adjacent? For example, A minor to E minor. Hmm. So, to tell you the truth, a lot of times I don't do bass runs between uh, chords. I don't do bass runs between every chord. Uh, but what I would do is uh, just pick the notes out of the scale that makes sense. If I really wanted to do a bass run, let me see if I can make something up on the fly. So the bass note for A minor is A. Bass note for the E minor is B. So one principle I'm going to do right now is anything chromatic going from one to the other, in other words, in half steps, is going to work, even if it's not actually a part of a scale. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to do some half steps. I just heard that. So E my chord, E note bass. I went a whole step there. I didn't want to go too much. Sounds right to me. Oh, that sounds good. Going to a C. I went up to a C. A minor to C. I got out of rhythm there. I'd have to change the rhythm on that bass. Yeah, that fit. And that I got to be in time with where the chord change is. So the best thing I could say about something like this is I always experiment and go with sounds right to use. I don't think uh, I know of a, a particular rule and it kind of depends on the style as well. Uh, for what I was doing sound good to me, but if I was playing, I don't know, hard rock, I don't know. I'd have to have some distortion to say. <laughs> Mm, let's see. She's also asking A minor to F. Let me see if I can come up with something. 
Start with A minor. Sounds dark, but works for me. Um, so I just went down chromatically to F. A minor. See the G's an easy one because it's. I know this is clearly in a, the scale going from C to G. G, C to G. I just went down notes in the scale of uh, C. My, I, C and G sound like it's in the key of C. But if I want something more exotic, let me see if I can make up something chromatic. Okay, something a little more interesting. It would fit in some styles, depending on what I wanted and not in others. So I want to give you some examples and, and kind of go through the process myself. But I'm thinking to myself, there's no one right way to do this. A lot of it has to do with what you're after, the sound that you're after. And, you know, that's a combination of style that you're playing in. And if you're writing music, which I know Shulamit does, um, you have a lot of freedom. You're if you're trying to imitate somebody else, you'd want to hear what they did and probably play something, if not exactly similar, if you want to imitate that particular artist. But if you're making up your own stuff, you have a lot of flexibility, which can also sound terrible <laughs> because you can do anything. Bottom line is you have to learn over time some judgment about what works, not if I'm following the rule or not, or if there's a way to do this or not. Usually that's the case. Now, I took years of theory and... I'm not going to say it didn't help me, but it seemed like I spent a lot more time on it than the amount of benefit I got, at least at first. Nowadays, the theory kind of guides me without me having to think about it, which is helpful. And when I'm talking that theory, what I'm specifically talking about is uh, analyzing pieces of music and figuring out why they work and why they didn't. For the most part, the, in summary, I could tell you, analyzing music is going back to what the artist did and trying to make rules out of it. But the, he wasn't the artist like Bach wasn't following rules. He was doing something that sounded good to him and was contemporary. In other words, what they, people were used to hearing at the time. Let's go on to the next question. Instead of a bass run, I would like to use transitional chords. What would I use? So show me, I'm not a, I might need some clarification on transitional chords. I'm, I'm going to assume to start off that you just mean some chords that go between a chord to kind of bridge the two. And um, I, I know in jazz, uh, when I was uh, playing jazz and doing some writing in jazz, not much, I never call myself a jazz guitar player, we would use little chords, passing chords, we would mostly call them. So let's say I was going from um, this chord to this chord, or I, I want to go to this G major seventh chord, this is a jazzy chord, and I want to go from a... An A minor seven to a G. I would use a chord in between that that bridge the two. And often, if I were looking at the notes, what I'm doing is um, taking the notes from one chord to another and putting some notes in between them and see what I come out with. Now I know the forms. I don't have to think that way anymore. If I were going from a uh, A minor seven to a G major seven, I would I would use some chords that I know go down by the bass notes going down by half steps to the G. So depending on the style of music and what you want to do, for the most part, um, I wouldn't think that way in terms of pop music. Uh, I would uh, basically use my ear and see what sounded good. Just, I wouldn't try to think out what kind of chord do I need to put between these two chords uh, because there's just not a lot of that in pop folk style music. And it's going to sound a little clunky if I tried to intellectualize it. That's my opinion. Next question. Which guitar book should I follow to learn acoustic guitar step by step? Hmm. The best acoustic guitar book. Now, there's a question. <laughs> and so he's listed three common books. How Leonard Complete Guitar or the Individual you know, they come in one, two, and three, but you can buy the complete. They have all three books. Uh, Alfred's Basic Guitar Method, 
Guitar for Dummies. These are three very popular books. And um, <clears throat> I, let's see, and it says I've, I have all three of these books. So it doesn't have to worry about going out and buy them. Out of which Hal Leonard's book and Alfred's has online audio access. And I think that's a benefit. If you can hear something, I think that that's a big help. So let me think of how to answer this question. Which book is best is, <laughs> that's uh, very subjective. They're all best sellers. So somebody thinks each of them are best. And uh, I am, <laughs> in my humble opinion, I'm not worthy to <laughs> decide which book is best in the ultimate sense. I would say they're all good. At least a lot of people use them and a lot of teachers use them. I know I'm familiar with all these books. I don't really remember them well because I haven't used them in a long time, but I've used them at some point all in the past. And they all seem, from what I remember, about equally good with some slight differences. If I were learning myself, I'd probably use all three books and, and look at the same concept in each of the books. I wouldn't pick one necessarily as the book, but I might pick one that just seemed to speak to me more and follow it and then use the other ones as references rather than just jumping constantly with no preference for one book. That way, at least I have some guidance because they're going to use a little different order. And if you tried to literally follow all three books, you'd be jumping all over the place. So I'd pick one kind of I'd look for something that speak to me, what made sense to me, or just like the way they use the pictures or they explain things. Uh, there's nobody's going to say one's well, somebody might, but I, I definitely don't think one's bad and one is good. That said, it's a tough job to get a book and learn to play guitar. I'm not saying you can't do it, but there's a lot of information missing. Think about this. You're using a visual process for the most part, to learn something that is an audible audio process. People who learn guitar are listening and making changes by ear. Yeah, they're using your eyes to kind of guide, but that's really a secondary uh, information, so to speak. And I get this all the time because, especially in our society, we're very, very visually oriented. And uh, I think it's very common to expect if you see something, you should be able to do it, at least subconsciously, if not consciously. And with uh, guitar books, I mean, I've tried learning from books and I certainly learned some things, but woo, um, nothing compared to, I'll tell you, I learned more by listening to al albums and trying to copy them. It was very hard and I certainly didn't get it right most of the time. But the process really kicked my butt and made me um, use my ears and, and focus on what sounded good and what didn't. And eventually, my ears told me, no, i got to do something a little different until it worked. That, with the guidance of some good teachers and videos, I think, are, in my opinion, and as a medium, they're a much better vehicle than books because you see the motion and you can hear at the same time. Now, the trick is to find videos that are in the sequential order and that teach the things that build on the other if you're just learning. And I get that's part of the Darmendra's problem. I don't know if you can tell I hesitate to say it because I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but feel free to correct me and I apologize in advance. Darmendra is the best I can do. Um, he's learning. His next question will reveal a little more. After 18 months, I'm still struggling with transitioning from E to D and from D to A chords. My my wrist my wrist hurts and I, I mostly can't. Uh, I'm having problems with a D chord in particular. Eighteen months and you're still having problems switching from E to D and D to A. Now, first of all, there's information blaringly missing here. Do you mean you've been practicing for an hour or two a day for eighteen months, or Damendra? Do you mean you've practiced five minutes? a week for 18 months <laughs> and skip three months in between. <laughs> and this is where you're at. Without that information, I, I'm really missing something big. I'll tell you, I venture to guess that you're not practicing consistently. And I would say you're dealing with beginner information. So the other thing I would look at is maybe you jumped too far. You went to, uh, too big a steps. But if you're dealing with a D and an E and A chord, no, that's not the problem. But you're probably not practicing and you're probably not getting good information. What I would recommend is first thing to do 
it's get clear if you're willing to make time to practice or not. If you're if you're going to practice once in a while, and I'm not saying you are. I, this is for everybody because I don't know you. But if you're going to practice once in a while and then feel frustrated because you're not getting anywhere, you're just beating yourself up for nothing. You, it's you're expecting something that's not possible. You're not going to practice for a, a few minutes once in a while and actually be able to play the guitar. Uh, maybe there's some people that are born that way, but most people aren't. I know I'm not. I have to practice regularly, and I'm talking pretty much a little every day. I do usually take Sundays off, but um, every other day I practice at least something and sometimes quite a bit more than five, 10 minutes. Uh, I would practice at least 10 minutes a day and stick to, you know, some of the basic chords to start with. I would start with following maybe one of your books if that's what you want. But even better is find an online guitar course that has videos that you can see what they're doing a little more clearly. And of course, if you can find a teacher or somebody who plays, I think that's a real help. Even if you can just find somebody who plays guitar well and get some pointers, don't take everything too seriously. I have found players who aren't necessarily good teachers. And some of the things they say are just, you know, they expect things out of students that aren't realistic. So you have to take that with a grain of salt, unless you find a good teacher that can put things orderly, step by step. I've had both. I've had good teachers and I've had people I just jumped around and I know that it, I tended to think something was wrong with me. So be careful there. Okay. So, and I made a video on dealing with wrist pain, but the thing is, if you're not going to practice, um, you know, they got to go together. You have to make adjustments and do a little each day and not practice for too long if it's painful, but keep coming back at a little at a time. I will put a link to my uh, newer video on dealing with uh, wrist pain and thumb pain. I even just made one with finger pain that'll be released in a, in a day or so. Uh, no, it's really, sorry. Um, so I'll put a link at least to the wrist and thumb pain to your questions, Armendra. So check out the blog in a day or two and I'll have a link on the blog post to this. Okay, let me check and see if we got any questions over here in the chat. Any questions? So I'm glancing down. I see question by Mark. Question, what is the model and price of the guitar you're using? Hmm. This is a Yamaha. It, um, I'll be honest with you. I don't, when I was younger, this was, I, I really paid a lot of attention to that. I don't pay that much attention to now. I'll grab any guitar. If I like the sound of it, good enough. And I'll go with it. Uh, let me also tell you in full disclosure, I own a music store and we're a Yamaha dealer. So for the most part, I'm leaning towards Yamaha because I can buy them at wholesale. I, I basically can get a guitar from my store, right? I'm the owner. I can get any guitar I want. I can put it back in the store and get a different one. But I love this guitar, that said. I I picked this out at the trade show. They call it NAM. Once a year, all uh, the music store owners go to a trade show and we see the newest products. This guitar is made in Japan. Um, I played uh, a lot of Yamaha acoustics and I really liked it. I liked it. It was a little smaller, easier to, to hold. And I think the sound is great. It lists, I believe, for around, people are buying it, I think for a twelve to $1,400 price range. Now, in the course of guitars, I know for brand new beginners, something that sounds like a lot of money, but you know, it's like anything else. You can pay uh, a cheap price for a uh, car, or you could pay, you know, $100,000 for a car. And to somebody who has a $100,000 car, a, a $30,000 car is pretty cheap, right? <laughs> so it's, it's all reference point. For me, uh, this price of guitar is very affordable. Uh, and not that I'm rolling in money, but I'm comparing it to other guitars I have. One guitar I have costs, a handmade guitar costs over $7,000. Uh, and to me, it's worth it. It it gets the sound that I use in my recordings and, and live performances. So it's worth it for me. But I didn't start that way. I didn't get that one until years and years of playing and moving up till I could, you know, hear the differences in what I was looking for. Highly recommend this guitar. If you're in the uh, three to hundred dollar price range for guitars, I recommend the Yamaha. I think there's a lot of bang for the buck. Um, but I think Fender and uh, Seagull and, uh, they're all pretty comparable. Um, hope that helps. Oh, model. Let's look. AC5R. And it does have electronics built in, which I don't use very much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't spill. But um, they're good electronics. So when I do use them, I really like it. 
Um, thanks for asking, Mark. Of course, I'd like to talk about my guitars, but I got to put a lid on it for now and let me know if you have any more questions. Uh, okay, I'm looking for the word question. Uh, question. I am a beginner practicing 30 to 45 minutes a day, four to five days a week. Chord switching is problem is a problem. How to structure my practice? Okay, first of all, uh, I commend you for um, right off telling me and and having the mindset to say, "Gee, I'm I'm going to make time to practice this." And thirty to forty five minutes a day is good. It's significant. Let me say, as a beginner, uh, and I assume you're a beginner. You said chord changes are a problem, but you didn't say which chords. I assume. Uh, basic chords, but if you're having a problem changing elaborate jazz chords, that's compared to, you know, you may not be a beginner. Let's say you're a beginner. I would encourage you to practice maybe uh, 20 minutes at a session and then spread them out because you're going to get more focus and more attention. And if you're having a problem switching chords, I don't know how long you've been playing, but the thing is you probably need to spend more focused attention on switching the chords and comparing to some video lessons or if you have a teacher to what they're doing and practicing it in a focused manner each day that you're practicing. And I say this because I see a lot of people who practice, say I practice an hour a day, but they're just playing through stuff without really focusing on what's going wrong. And they don't get much better much <laughs> very quickly. 20 minutes, really pay attention, warm up and warm up just by maybe making some chords. I'd like to have, if you're a brand new beginner, I like to have them, brand new beginners do this basic exercise. I call it a finger developer. You just play through each note, one fret at a time, up to the third fret and go on. I don't use the pinky for brand new beginners. And I, I have a video on that too, which I will, uh, I'll put a link to when this post comes out, when the post comes out for this live show. So, but it, it's a pretty simple exercise. You just go very slowly with the attention on being getting your finger in the right place, because that exercise is gonna actually help you play chords. The biggest thing is as you do the exercise, because it's repetitive, you can put your attention on getting your finger in the right place and then the right amount of pressure in the hand position. Whereas when you're doing something more complicated that you're not able to do, it's hard to focus on all those things at once. You're developing habits. You can't just use your mind to make your fingers do what they wanna do. You need to develop habits and then build on the habits. So this helps develop some basic habit that you apply when you make chords. Now your fingers tend to want to go in the right place. You want to get the angle right, the right amount of pressure, enough to make the chord, but no more, so you don't strain. And first get the chord and then release it. Play the chord, get the chord to sound good. Then add another chord to that process. I'll go to A7, that's another easy chord going from D. Get that chord, practice a little every day till it sounds good. You can play both chords. Then practice going from one to the other. Preferably with the right fingering. <laughs> okay. I can do it easy from the D because the two fingers stay the same. Okay. Now do it in time. This is a metronome is good for this or play along with a play along video. In my real guitar success, I use a lot of play along videos for that reason so you can play along. So you want to get it so you can do it in time, not just whenever you feel like it. Because if you're trying to play a song and you're used to just going as slow as you need to, you'll never be able to keep up with the changes. So, but start slow and get it right. Get it so you can make the chord, right? So I'm just doing two chords in the beginning. Then you add a third chord and you start the same process again, get the chord and so on and so on. This is a step-by-step -step methodical process. Within a month, you should be able to make the first few chords and change between them. If you're practicing like I'm suggesting, you probably will. That's a, a very average thing to be able to achieve. Now, some people are more gifted than others, but for the most part, I haven't seen anybody that really was practicing in the manner, really focusing on practicing, and in a month's time, couldn't get from the two first two basic chords. Hope that helps. Feel free to ask related questions. Sagar, I hope I said your name close to right. Uh, question, can I have one Skype lesson with you? I want to sing and play and have questions about chords that match the scale. We'll be singing, can play 
uh, can pay you via PayPal. Um, I, I appreciate the offer. Um, unfortunately, I'm not available for uh, individual private lessons at this time to the general public. I just don't have time. I'm, I'm working from morning to night, both on my live music school. I have a brick and mortar music school as well as the internet lesson. So I put all my attention on my membership program. What I would suggest is you join my membership program and get what you can out of there. It's a much more efficient and affordable way to get the basics of learning guitar. And it's only 25 bucks a month uh, or less than that if you pay by the year. The other thing is, is I do extend uh, some private lessons to students uh, for pay uh, uh, by PayPal to only to members of my uh, Real Guitar Success membership. That said, I really think you should at least try what's in the membership before you reach out uh, for lessons. But I would I would uh, extend, um, find times that would work for you uh, for a private lesson if that's really what you want to do, if you're a member. Because one of the things is I, I have to put some railings on my time. But the other thing is, if you're a member, I can say, you know, practice this exercise. Uh, I'm not going to go through this exercise uh, every private lesson for the next three lessons. I'll just give you this video. And I don't want to take your money if I don't need to. But at the same time, I can focus on things that you really need to hear from a private teacher. So... Hope that helps. Question. Okay. I am a beginner and have a right-handed guitar. Okay. Although I am a lefty. Got it. Should I learn to use my right hand, play upside down, or should I switch my strings to feel more comfortable? Well, this is a question I've gotten often, actually. And um, I've done some research also. Let me see. I want to say, first of all, I have my opinion. I'm clear that I'm not the only opinion. There are people that say, yes, left-handed people should always play a left-handed guitar. And there are other people, other teachers that say flat out, no, there's no reason for it. Just play a regular guitar. I tend towards the camp of there's no reason to buy a left-handed guitar. Um, in, in Here's my thinking on that. Uh, when you're playing guitar, both hands need to work and to learn what to do. Uh, everybody, even whether you're right hand or left hand, tells me they have all these, you know, they have problems. The fingers just don't do what they're supposed to do. And they have to learn through a step-by-step -step process. It doesn't seem like it's important whether the left hand does one thing or the right hand does something else because they seem like about equal in task. Sometimes more one way or the other, but nowhere near as for any reason to switch the guitar around. So you see, I'm, I'm making chords and strumming with my right hand in the beginning, something like this. Maybe I'll use a pick. As you can see, there's no reason the right hand has to do something more complex. I'm right-handed than the left hand. Matter of fact, right now, I said the left hand is doing something more complex. Maybe if I was finger picking, huh? That, that might change things up a little, but that's, you know, that's one aspect of playing. Now, um, there are a lot of guitarists that play left-handed and Jimi Hendrix probably being the most famous or well-known anyway. Uh, he certainly plays fine. So if you were to start left-handed and you really want to learn left-handed, I would never knock you for it. I, I would say go for it. I just don't think it's going to solve your problems. I think a lot of times people are looking for, you know, if I just switch my guitar around, everything will be easier. And I don't think it's going to work. I think you're going to find you're kind of in the same boat, just switched around. That said, if you're already playing left-handed and you've been practicing for a while, I don't know, weeks, months, but for a while you've developed some habits, I wouldn't try and switch you. I think that's so demotivational. I think if you're already playing a left-handed guitar or, as you say, switched around with a string switch, i just leave it that way and, and just deal with it. There are some downsides to learning left-handed. Every time you watch a video, you have to translate. And every time you look at most books, most books are are made to play guitar this way. Um, we say left-handed, right-handed, but it doesn't make sense because you're both-handed, right? The piano, it does. You wouldn't go like that. So even left-handed, right-handed. But I get the idea. People call this right-handed when it's just the most common way to hold the guitar. And most books are written for that. And most videos are made for that. So, you you know, if you grab a friend's guitar, it's going to be strung this way. You have some disadvantages. So um, 
Um, finally, in the, the end, the decision would be up for you. And I'd say either way, you're going to have to practice, get over some hurdles, um, use some persistent muscles, and eventually get to a place where you're glad you did it and, and you can build on that. Um, good question. Thanks for asking. That was Joe. Okay, let me go back to the written questions. Okay, practicing. This is from Joanne M. I have about 30 or so songs. She's been playing for a bit. So I can play, and I want to practice those songs, but I need to practice other stuff too. Should I practice songs, scales, exercises? I'm never sure, and on some days, time is short. So what is the effective practice routine? Oh, big question. <laughs> First of all, um, this is an ongoing question. Should I practice just play through songs, practice songs, or should I play through exercises or some combination of both? And what exercise? Scales, chord exercises, and so on. So that's one question. And then you've got the whole question of, you know, what's, how to develop an effective practice routine. I certainly couldn't cover thoroughly both of those questions, especially the second one is, is a, at least an hour long video and maybe more, maybe, you know, if you really want to do justice, uh, a series of lessons. But again, I do, have, um, I do have some video on developing a practice routine that uh, I'll put a link to when this comes out, the notes come out uh, for this post, for this live session. Whether you practice songs or exercise, here's my thought on that. You're going to get more bang for your buck when you practice exercises. Now, what exercise is another issue? But in general, exercises are designed to focus on a particular issue that, preferably if you pick, choose carefully, it's the issue you need to work on. When you play a song, that issue might come up somewhere in the song, but you have to play through the whole song to work on that issue. And even then, you're focusing on a lot of things. So I'm not sure you're really doing due diligence in terms of putting your attention on that specific issue. So naturally, if you spend two minutes, three minutes playing that song, and you spend 10, 15 seconds playing through that one exercise, each rep I'm talking, you can play in that three minutes, what, four times three, 12 times you can do that exercise and really focus on it where you could only deal with that issue one time in that same three minutes if you play through the song. You're probably going to get better faster on that specific issue doing the exercise. Exercises are designed to, to deal with specific issues and then integrate them into your playing songs. People who just play through songs in the practice sessions are really wasting a lot of time. Now, that said, I know it's fun, and I usually organize a practice session something like this. I start with a warm up, something kind of easy, and I tend to do, you know, one warm up for a while and then do a different one. But you know, a handful of different warm ups, not something different every day, and something routine so I can focus on the technique. Then I'll work on a specific issue. Usually, I'm using some type of exercises to work on those issues, and there are a variety of issues. It could be chords, scales for individual notes. If I'm improvising, I want to work on some licks or scales, uh, and so on. And uh, sometimes I'm, in one session, I'll have two main focuses. I'll work on this uh, for one period, and then I'll do another five, 10 minutes on this issue. Then I'll end with something for fun. That's where I'll usually play a song, something I can play, but I want to keep it up. Uh, the trick is I, I can't really play all my songs that way in a, even in a week's period of time. So I just pick and choose songs that either I want to play or that I think need a little refreshing. One thing helps if you're playing in a situation like when I'm playing concerts or live gigs, of course, I'm getting a lot of chances to play my song. So I do much less of that in my, re my practice sessions because I'm getting that in the live situations and I practice on issues in my practice sessions. If I find a song I, I fumbled on in a live session or I, I felt unconfident, I'll go back over it in my practice session, try to pick out what the issue is, and then either make an exercise or find an exercise and use it that way. So I'm going to leave it there because, again, this is a whole big topic of what exercises to use for what issues and all that. But in general, I recommend having a practice diary and paying attention to what you're practicing each day. I usually write down ahead of time and then make adjustments after I practice if I change my mind. Practice a little every day on a specific on a 
and and focus and make choices, conscious choices about what you're going to work on so you can kind of see some progress and decide, you know, that way you can decide how much you want to play songs, how much you want to play exercises. You're not just whatever you feel like in the moment. If I do what I just feel like, my practice degrades rapidly into just playing easy songs or playing a song that I just feel like playing and my progress slows down tremendously. I'm struggling. Next question. I'm, this is Tim C. I'm struggling with the metronome. We are not friends. I can relate, Tim. <laughs> I've been there many times in my life, and even this week, I, I could feel that way. It's likely, actually. It seems I overthink everything. Yes. <laughs> We're together on this. And while trying to use it, and it's a distraction. So overthinking, I can really relate to. I can practice with a metronome, but have to slow it way down to play in time with it. Hmm, hmm, that's good to hear. Yet I can tap my foot and play at normal speed. Should I keep it in my practice or just get used and get used to it? Or should, he didn't say this, but should I just scrap the metronome altogether? First of all, you don't have to use the metronome. And as a matter of fact, probably you shouldn't use the metronome for at least your a bulk of your practice. The metronome is something, it's a tool to use for a part of your practice and for specific reasons. Don't try to use the metronome for everything you practice. It'll make you crazy. <laughs> and it sounds like you already figured that part out. Um, tapping your foot and using a metronome, I'd say that means you probably do need to use a metronome. Because if you can tap your foot, but use the metronome and you have to slow down over tapping your foot, you're probably not as clear on the rhythm as you think you are. You have no control or not even, you don't even have a way to know if your foot is speeding up and slowing down. But the metronome will not be forgiving. That's why I think you need a metronome. You need to get real with the rhythm and the metronome will get you real. Um, I wouldn't even trust my foot. And I've been playing, what, 40 something years now? Ooh, gee, mama, I hate to admit it, but yes, <laughs> going on 50. I still wouldn't trust my foot 100%. It's, I'm pretty good, but I wouldn't trust it 100%. And I certainly wouldn't expect my students to be able to have perfect rhythm with their foot while they're playing the guitar and struggling with certain issues on the guitar. So use it for a portion of your practice. Yes, yeah, slow it down as slow as you need to go and then methodically pick it up. Again, this is where regular practice comes in, even short practice sessions these day. You can see if you're improving. It's okay to go up and down, by the way. That's going to happen. But over time, you can see if you're actually being able to play the same thing now at, at a higher metronome speed than you used to play it a week ago or so. Uh, but make it, you know, make it just for five minutes out of your practice session using a metronome. I think you'll feel a lot better about the metronome. And actually, I think over time, you'll find it even a little comforting because it sort of takes the job of having to keep track of the rhythm for you. That said, you don't want, uh, that's why I don't use it all the time also, because I don't want to rely on having a metronome. I want to internalize the rhythm and get better at being able to hear the rhythm internally with, you know, feel the rhythm rather than just depend on the outside force. But you go back and forth. Go out, use a metronome, five-minute session, do something else, see if it, you know, knock your rhythm a little more tighter. Next day, same thing, use a metronome again. It's By the way, it's also a great way to track your speed. I use metronome a lot when I'm working on speed exercises, and I'll do very slow, get it right, and then keep pushing the metronome until I play it sloppy. Then I'll back it up again, and hopefully I got it faster than when I first started and keep that back-and-forth process going. Good question, Tim. Let's see. Any new questions on this side, on the chat? The chat's on this side and the, <laughs> the pre-submitter on this side. Oh, you're welcome, Cigar. I'm looking for any more questions. I don't see any word questions. So I'm going to go back, see if I missed something. Hmm. 
Uh, I don't see anything that's sticking out. I won't spend too much time on this. Oh, I see a question, Joe. Uh, I've been practicing for weeks. However, there are a few chords that I can't apply despite the long time. Why? And how can I overcome it? Joe, if you've been practicing for a few weeks and you can't play the chords, you probably need to back up a little bit. Uh, and if you say a few chords, start with one and work on one. You don't have to get it perfect, but I usually use this 80% rule. Get it to where you can do it most like 80% before you add another chord. It's like you try to do too many things at once. And of course, you practice a couple of weeks. I don't know if you've been practicing five minutes a day for a couple of weeks or an hour a day or 10 minutes every three days. So probably... I would say in general, consistent practice, a little every day, maybe even twice a day if you're having a struggle issue with a particular thing, like 10 minutes in the early day and then 10 minutes later in the day, or even back to back with a rest in between. Works better than like doing one session and then waiting for a day. See, when you're first learning a, a new technique, I think of it like you have little pathways in your brain. This is just my interpretation. And when you do it over and over physically, the paths kind of get used to saying, yeah, this is the way we go. This is the way we go. If you do it and you let a day, two days go by, it gets muddied over again. And you're kind of like just brushing off and trying to get back to where you were. That's an exaggeration. You certainly retain some. But if you keep at it twice a day or at least without letting more than 24 hours go by, you tend to have to brush away less and get back on the path and make deeper grooves. What you're trying to do is get that path more ingrained so the fingers just go there without any hesitation. And that's come after many, many repetitions of correct playing. That's why, by the way, if you play something incorrectly, um, you're going to have to undo it later because you're building the path of an you know, of wrong fingering or incorrect hand position or something. So that's why I say go slow, get it right, and then keep picking up speed little by little. And keep at a little at a time. Don't let too far go between practice sessions, especially in the beginning. When you're more experienced, you have a little more leadway. You have basic habits that you're building on, and that's a different issue. But in the early stage, you really need that consistency. Okay, glad I caught that. I, I didn't um, see that first time around. Okay, let's go back to the written questions. Okay. I'm, as a relative beginner, I'm actually barring correctly with my index finger. Oh, uh, is, he says, uh, as a relative beginner, um, barring with the index finger is, is, it's not sounding good. <laughs> it's not sounding clear. I understand a uh, bar chord theory and how to use the fingers. I know how to make all these chord forms, the E major shape, he says, or the A shape, which would be like that. Uh, for example, but um, my left elbow ends up on my left knee and the guitar neck pointing towards my knees, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe in order to get anything that sounds like a chord. And uh, do I need to consider changing to a classical guitar position instead of re instead of restring the guitar to my right thigh? I didn't quite understand that, but let's just say, I, I think the question is, should I change to a different classical guitar position? That's this, like this. Uh, instead of the, oh, uh, the standard position, which is like this for folk style guitar. And that's what I'm used to. So first of all, John, no, I, I don't think this is an issue of changing the position of the guitar. Um, and the reason classical guitar works so well for classical guitarists is it really solidifies the guitar and you're doing a lot of work up here. You don't want even a little shaking or moving and it's much more solid. You need a footstool and kind of raise the left foot. I do sometimes play this way when I'm working on a classical guitar piece, but not when I'm playing uh, either steel string acoustic or a flamenco style uh, guitar um, with the nylon string. No, um, the first issue I see is if you're doing an A shape and an E shape and you, and you still can't get the E shape, you, you, you went too fast. You skipped steps. You skipped, um, uh, th this is a, uh, often adults, I'm guilty of this as, as much as everybody. We think it, so we should be able to do it. Theory, intellectual understanding precedes doing. Doesn't work in music. Doesn't work in dance either, by the way. Tried that with salsa dancing and stepped on a lot of feet. Uh, got really embarrassing. But no, you need to practice it 
your best friend is repetitions and doing it correct repetitions, not wrong. Practicing slowly, getting a step, back up. Get the basic bar position and the basic E chord first. As a matter of fact, if you were my student, I would have you go all the way back to a basic uh, um, power type chord, then add a few more fingers to that, then practice the bar separately, then put them together, move it around till that chord sounded good, at least up to 80%. Then uh, try the minor version of that, the minor seven, then go on to that. This is by far the hardest bar chord, especially on acoustic guitar. And I would not have students doing this until they could uh, at least reasonably well play the basic uh, chord. Plus, you can use this chord a lot, especially for F. And you can play a B up here. So you can make a lot of progress without even bothering with this A-shaped bar chord. And I would build you step by step on that. I would have you do power chords and then practice this bar separately and then put those together. That's what we do in the Real Guitar Success membership. That's what I do. Uh, in, with private students, um, I, I think that you're, um, by changing your position at all, you're uh, just hurting yourself, honestly. Um, just, you need to back up. You're trying to, you're trying to uh, here's the analogy I often use with students that I, I see who come to me and try and do things that they're not even close to. They're trying to jump up a three, the three-story building from the ground up, and they're frustrated because they can't jump that high instead of going out and getting a ladder and taking it step by step. Um, it's, it's, un, you're feeling frustrated and I would be frustrated, but you're trying to do something that's not doable really. And it's not very likely that you're going to be able to do it. So if you're doing, if you keep doing the same thing, I would predict that you're just going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your, if you're changing position, I guess you're going to hurt your wrist and your thumb and other aspects of your fingers. If you're older, like me, you're probably going to end up causing some damage, some carpal tunnel thing going on eventually. Hope that helps. Step by step. <laughs> You've heard this before. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's it for the pre-submitted questions. Back over here. Hi, Shalomit. I see you. Uh, I see you on there. Let me go down. I'm looking at the chat. Whoa, man, a lot of chats since I looked over last. How come all of a sudden? Or maybe I missed something. Let's see. Oh, you're welcome, Shulamit. Um, question. Ooh. Question. I've been practicing daily for a long time on a song, Maria, for from Tariga, Francesco Tariga. However, four finger chords that I'm still struggling with, but don't work. Why? Well, hmm. <clears throat> uh, to be honest with you, that, that's a kind of question I, I can't really answer. Really, the, the way I would answer that is Tariga uh, made a lot of beautiful pieces for classical guitar. And uh, if you're not able to finger the chords on that particular song, you probably jump too far. You probably need to go back and work up some uh, easier pieces, classical guitar type pieces, and get the basic technique, including, excuse me, including the chording. Uh, with classical guitar, uh, I had the experience of... <clears throat> I took classical guitar lessons from several teachers who probably were mediocre uh, at best. And, and classes were, you know, I didn't actually get the one-on-one -on -one attention. And I certainly could play some stuff, but then I went to a, a real classical teacher at the university and started private lessons. And the first, uh, second lesson actually, he had me play through my repertoire, what I was working on. And he told me very directly, your killing it. You're butchering these songs. You need to go back, follow my step-by-step -step path. And even though it hurt, he was by far the, the best teacher. And I, I did, even then, appreciate that he was willing to just be honest with me. And I, I felt like he really knows how to help me, not just string me along to give money each week in spite of, you know, killing these songs. Um, one of them was uh, a piece by... Uh, uh, called Recuerdos de la Alhambra, which is a tremolo piece. And I was, I'm looking back on it, and I was butchering it. And I was doing stuff that was not really helping my technique. I had to go back to easier pieces, work them up, and then, you know, with his guidance, get back to playing things and, and play it, you know, make jumps that were reasonable for me, not these big jumps. So I, I'd have to see your hand position to give you more help on that. But it's very likely what I'm telling you is the 
the most important uh, advice that you could get. I, if you have a teacher, um, that would be between you and the teacher to decide, you know, really, is there some exercises or some easier songs that I should build up to this? Or is there just, should I just work on this one little part for these chords and, or maybe or some exercise or how's the best way to work on that? I don't know what it looks like. I don't know that particular song or the fingering. So I couldn't help with that. And uh, this question is, Tarahini, do you have a fingerstyle guitar lesson video? I have many. If you look on YouTube and just type in my name, Thomas Michel Fingerstyle, you'll see many videos on YouTube. Also in my Real Guitar Success membership, there's a whole step-by-step -step course on fingerstyle guitar and fingerstyle playing. And I'm adding to it every month, actually. I, I create new fingerstyle lessons every month. Uh, though the main focus in the beginning is on getting some of the basics. Oftentimes I find people are doing finger style, and this may have nothing to do with you, but they can't do basic chords and they're trying to, they like finger style. It really helps to at least be able to play some basic chords to do finger style because otherwise you're trying to do too many things at once. Unless you're learning classical guitar, classical literature, that's usually done by reading notes and you know, you start from the beginning, learn to read notes and, and getting using your fingers and playing one note at a time, then adding the thumb and that, that turns into chords. Thanks for asking. A strumming practice routines. Wayne, I think he's asking if, um, if I can recommend a strumming practice routine. Um, so there's not one universal strumming practice routine. This sounds like something I would need to know specifically what your issues are. You are a brand new beginner. You've never strummed before. So I, I would give you some basic strumming exercises. If you've been strumming for a while, but you can't keep rhythm, that's a different exercise or series of exercises. If you're, you're strumming, but you're having a hard time changing chords and strumming, well, that's another issue. Probably you need to back up and work on the chords and the strumming and build them up little by little, uh, get two chords going and switch accurately at a slow pace, you know, step by step. So if you want to add more information, I'll try to answer a more specific question, but that was a little bit too broad to give a really clear, specific answer. Question, what, what did you do before music, playing guitar? Uh, Mark, mm, let me think about that. Well, I was a teenager when I started playing guitar so I did high school. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe more to the point, my first passion was uh, the sciences, chemistry. Uh, I, was, I was pretty clear I was going to be a, a scientist, a chemist. When I was um, in grade school, no, in uh, junior high, I got pulled out of class because some kid had, I was making fireworks and selling them to other kids. And some kid had uh, burned his face from blowing on the fuse of one of my fireworks. And so I had to take down my laboratory. And I mean, I was really serious about this or into it, I should say. Um, I did kind of realize in high school, the switch was two things. One is, it occurred to me, I, if my the way I wanted to do science was sort of like Edison. I wanted to experiment and do things that were um, in inventing. And uh, if I'm going to do stuff with fireworks, all I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I didn't want to go. I didn't want to work for a big oil company or the government or something. That just that wasn't what I had in mind. I like you know my own laboratory, and that that didn't look either safe or uh, like a good career path. And uh, the other thing was, I realized I was really isolated a lot in the whole chemistry world in my mind. Um, and I felt a little disconnected from other people. And as soon as I started even a little bit playing, music brought me out. I felt like it helped educate the emotional side of me and I could connect with other people better. And I was really attracted to that. And I, I think it worked. Um, I do feel, uh, it's hard for me to put myself back to where I was in high school, like kind of both shy and introverted. Uh, I'm much better now that integrated. And I still wonder once in a while all the money I could have made with my skills and math skills. I was good at math where a lot of people around me weren't, but I think I made the right choice. I really love playing music. I really love expressing myself that way. Mostly I love um, making recordings because it is kind of like experimenting and putting things together and they eventually come out with something that you're proud of. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Mark. Dave, 
when I play certain chords, my guitar keeps an echo going inside the hole. Hmm. For a long time, for a long time, sometimes I like that sound. Sounds like reverb or something, huh? And sometimes not. How can I control it? Um, so interesting question, Dave. Um, I don't know. I don't think I know what that is. And um, I think I'd have to hear your guitar. You know, if you want, you're, Dave's a member of Real Guitar Success. Make a, a little recording, even with your phone or something, and uh, put it in the forum so I can hear it. Uh, I, I want to... And I'll, I'll see if I can tell from the recording. It, it could be a video on your phone. That's easiest nowadays. But all I'm after is the audio. I don't care what's on the video. You don't even have to show me the guitar in the video. But I, I'm just after the audio in one form or another. If the video is easiest, that's fine. And I'll listen and see if I can give you some feedback. Um, interesting idea. I'm curious now. I'd actually like to hear. Uh, interesting you said that. I have a guitar at the store, by the way, that has a built-in electronic device that's reverb. So when you play it, it actually makes a reverb sound. You can control it louder and softer. And I know what you mean. When I get it kind of loud, I, I don't like it. It's a, But a little slight reverb is kind of cool. But I don't know where that could be coming from just from an acoustic guitar. Maybe some string is resonating or something. I, I get weird sounds occasionally from uh, buzzing, but that doesn't sound like what you're talking about. It usually, often it's my my tuner is uh, buzzing or there's a string that's starting to break. It's not right. I need to change the string. Next question. Thanks, Thomas, for the great video. You're very welcome. Erdogan. Love from India. Thank you. Question. There we are, Tim. I've started the sixth adventure and try to keep up with the monthly lessons. The sixth adventure is uh, mostly about strumming, but I use it as an opportunity to kind of uh, review. This is for you, Tim, but for anybody that's interested. I use the opportunity to review stuff in the first five adventures, kind of put it all together and give you some practice on it. Also, the bar chords. Am I trying to do too much? I usually spend an hour in the morning and 30 minutes at night. Ah, good practice routine. And it's a good question too. It's one that I can relate to you even on a, at a kind of a peer level. I often have to make choices. I, I have more things I'd like to practice and get good at than I could realistically do. And I usually do a couple practice sessions a day. Um, shorter than you, by the way, right now anyway. Um, I think, yes, I think, it seems like the stuff that's in the sixth adventure is going to help you both with bar chords and it's going to help you with the uh, monthly guitar gym, the practice plans that's in the gym. So I would say, and there's no absolute run right. This is just some ideas I'm kind of throwing out that I think um, to help. I would maybe finish that sixth adventure and focus on the issues that come up in the sixth adventure and then go on to bar chords. I do bar chords in a very methodical way. And it's a little disconnect if you're doing the beginning of the bar chord course and the sixth adventure, which is strumming. It's just different things is what I'm trying to say. So the other thing is, um, I, I think it's more realistic to do the bar chord course and the guitar gym. That is kind of a good blend because you're kind of working on specific step-by-step -step lessons in the bar chord course. And then the guitar gym throws different things at different times. And it's a nice balance between the step-by-step -step and this, what I call non-sequential learning, where you're hitting at different things in different ways. But you're doing two sequential learning. And that's where I'm thinking, get the sixth adventure out of the way and, you know, trying to do a good job on it, at least up to 80%, as we talk about, and then go on to the bar chord course. Also, by the way, if you're doing an hour session, I strongly recommend you put a break in between and then refocus and come back. So do uh, two 30 minute sessions with a five minute break or two 25 minute sessions and, you know, make it a full hour with a, a, a short break in between. Uh, the evening session sounds fine. Hope that helps. This is, uh, this is a great question. This is, uh, I really like everybody to hear this. This is the, the kind of way of thinking that will get you really good at playing guitar eventually. And the next question is about how many chords do we need to learn to play country and pop music, Daisy. 
Okay, let me see. So that's that's a there's a certain amount of that that's just subjective. It depends on the kind of country and pop. You could learn, I'd say, you could play a lot of music with five chords, a lot, uh, open chords, country music, pop too. Though pop, generally, country pop and pop have a little more range of chords. And when I say, you know, kind of traditional country tends to use less chords and pop modern country tends to broaden out more. I think a dozen chords and depending on what you wanted to play, most country pop, you could do a lot with country pop. Now there are issues that come up. If what you would need after that is more chords because you want to change to different keys, depending on your singing. If you only have a dozen chords, you are going to be limited what keys you can play in. If you could learn another dozen or so, that would broaden tremendously the amount of keys that you could play in. And <coughs> I would say it's definitely more important to learn just a few chords and be able to use them to change smoothly, at least at a, a moderate tempo, than to just keep learning chord after chord after chord. Focus on getting what you know up to that 80% and then adding to it instead of just learning like a bunch of a library of chords that you can't really use properly. Hmm. I think that's all I could say about that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, there are you're going to come across songs that use a certain chords. After, let's say, you learn your first dozen chords or so, you're going to come across songs that use a chord that you're not familiar with. You can always do like a lot of us do. We can play a lot of stuff, and then we come across a new chord, and we just work on that new chord for a while and integrate the song, and now we add another one to our repertoire of chords that we know. So you don't have to learn all the chords to be able to just play every song. You're going to learn more as you go along. Thanks, Stacy. What this is Tim, what is the best way to understand modes in practicing on your guitar? Well, first I'll, I'll say it depends on what you want to play. If you're playing jazz type improvisation or you know kind of that jazz fusion rock fusion, um, modes can be useful. Um, I don't have a regular practice on modes, so I'm not going to give you a lesson on using modes. I think that would be disingenuine right now. I have, I do understand modes and I've used them and I use them in composing and I have practiced them earlier in my life when I was playing more different variety of styles of music. Now I've focused in on um, writing my own original music and I don't just go out and play different styles of music all the time. So I don't need to use all these different modes. I don't know what you want to do, but modes may not be uh, important for you. That's what I'll say. You know, it's not that you shouldn't learn them or that they don't have some value, but they not, may not be the best place to put your time and energy right now. Modes are most commonly used for either understanding certain kinds of composition or for improvisation, usually in a jazzier sense, because for most rock, blues, and flamenco, we don't think in terms of modes. We, we, uh, we do know some patterns, but ultimately we're using our ears to look for the notes that fit the the melody that we're trying to play. And then we have a whole repertoire of licks that we throw in between there to, you know, so we don't have to think out every single note. So I, again, I'm not sure, but at least I want to pose that question. I, our mode's really the best place to put your time and energy. You welcome, Daisy. So it looks like I'm at the end of the questions. If I miss your question, I apologize. Um, but please restate it at the end there, and I'll take one more look before I close up for today. I really, I want to get everybody who's on the call today. Um, so I will take one more look, and in the meantime, I'm going to do that drawing for this week for the people that have completed the practice plan for the month of July. <laughs> i got to be careful. We're in August, but we're going for the month of July, <laughs> the completed practice plan. Let's see, and I'm using my trusty hat. Let's see who we got. Shake them up a little bit. I'm not looking. Let's see. Patricia, you did it. Okay. I'll be sending you a $50 Amazon gift card. And again, good work, everybody who completed the practice plan for the month. One more quick look. Any new questions? No, nope. I think we're done for the day. Oh, no. Oh, snuck one in there, huh, Tim? Are you going to stay with the Thursdays? Um, I don't know. It, it has to do with this whole COVID thing and things are a little up in the air. My schedule had to shift because of that. 
I think until we're back to at least um, back to the physical school, so we can open up the physical school here in California. We we still can't uh, open up my physical music school until we're back to there. It's going to be on Thursdays, and I, I'm guessing, and I'm just guessing that next month will be Thursdays. I in general would like to go back to Tuesdays, but if everybody says Thursdays is great, I could stay on Thursday too. So just know that's an option. Go ahead and please feel free to leave me your vote uh, in the chat or when I on on YouTube in the comments. Let me know there too. Lockdown. Yeah, he's, I'm not the only one that's in lockdown. Yes, I get that. Yes, everybody's dealing with this, huh? So I, I know everybody knows what I'm talking about. I have one little bit uh, that I want to make everybody aware of. I started a 30-day challenge for myself to do 30 videos in a row. Now, for you, it's 30 days of guitar coaching. And I'm on day three today? No, day three three or four, I forget, I'll go figure it out, but I have to make a video today. Please check out my uh, guitar coaching videos, my 30 days of guitar coaching videos. They're going on a new one on YouTube every day. And I would love to hear your comments. And most importantly, um, your support, give me a thumbs up, just gives me some encouragement. And I need it, I'll tell you honestly, it's it's not easy, <laughs> but I'm committed. When I, when I say I'm gonna do something, you really, you're gonna have to put me in the hospital to keep me from doing it because I keep my commitments. I'm going to do this 30 days of guitar videos. I want to know what to make the videos on. Give me some questions. Give me some, go on there and leave your comments and let me know what you'd like me to make a video on in these 30 days of guitar coaching. So I appreciate it. With that, one more check. Any other questions? Looks like we're done for today. Thanks again for joining me. I look forward to seeing you, if not before, next month, first I guess it'll be Thursday of next month, but I'll send you an email. Bye for now.